Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephen Palachuk. I am the IT Accessibility Program Specialist here at MDOD. Uh, I am joined today by Carl Bellinger. Carl, if you want to introduce yourself quick. Sure. I'm Carl Bellinger. I'm a non-visual accessibility analyst at the National Federation of the Blind. Happy to be with you all today, co-presenting with Stephen. Thank you. So welcome to Making an Accessible Learning Experience, a joint presentation by the NFB, Center for Excellence in Non-Visual Access, and the MDOD, or MDTAP, IT Access Initiative. A few housekeeping items before we jump into it. First off, closed captioning is available. We have uh, a, a closed captioner typing for us today, so you should be able to select that option from the menu ribbon on your Zoom webinar. Uh, if there's any technical problems, please let us know. And we'll try to resolve them during the webinar. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, thanks to our partnership with the NFB, uh, we have Scribe for Meetings running. So I will post a link in chat. You also should have received an email about a half hour prior to the presentation that had this link, uh, Scribe for Meetings. Uh, we'll be talking about it a little bit more later, but it is a way for uh, print disabled individuals to have an accessible form of the shared on-screen content. Mostly it's going to be applying to the PowerPoint, but uh, if you want, you can click that. It also lets you download the slides. Uh, when we do have the recording available and posted on our YouTube page, we will also send out the slide deck in addition to it, so you can get it from both sources. Uh, Carl, is there anything else you want to add? No, I think we're good. Okay. Well, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, one last thing. Um, there will be two points for questions. Uh, the first one will be after the document accessibility portion, uh, which is like the first 20 minutes of the presentation. Then there'll be another one at the end. Um, you could post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we also, you should have chat available, so you can use chat as well. Um, we'll pretty much relegate them to those two time periods, though. Now, with that, uh, I want to just talk a little about, about who we are first. Um, I'll go ahead and start talking about the Maryland Technology Assistance Program, or MDTAP, which is a program under the Maryland Department of Disabilities. So its goal is to provide statewide access to assistive technology through equipment demonstrations, loans, reuse, financing, and training. Uh, effectively, that boils down to a library service for various types of assistive technology. That includes uh, things like Braille notes and uh, uh, more complicated technology like that. It also can go to more physical devices such as uh, a, a feeding device for someone who has like Parkinson's or some other disability that affects the, the physical functions uh, or motor skills. And so there's a very, and it also has um, uh, other things like magnifiers uh, or other smart technologies that might be uh, useful to in the home or for other methods or other areas of living. Uh, but also, uh, we'll point to other resources that can be used for uh, financing, like changes to your home or to your vehicle, some modifications. That is the uh, financial loan program that helps uh, get low cost or low interest loans for those kinds of modifications or other kinds of devices, since some of these can get somewhat pricey. There's other programs available through it, such as the Technology Reuse Center, also known as Matter where uh, various uh, equipment is donated to the center that, uh, say, uh, uh, a relative uh, upgraded to a new device and no longer needs their old one or something. They can donate it to the center. The center will refurbish it, polish it up, and then put it out available uh, for uh, someone else looking for that kind of device. So offers another alternative for finding these kind of technologies. The other part of MDTAP is the IT Access Initiative, which I'm a part of. 
Our goal is to improve policies and practices in state IT procurement and ensure equal access to state agency information technology for citizens with disabilities. Uh, we are effectively a consultancy for other state agencies or state departments in how they can uh, better implement accessibility policies, making sure that anything they procure meets with the Maryland Non-Visual Access Clause, which is our version of the federal Section 508 law that establishes the need for accessibility and the requirements for accessibility and procurement. We also help with uh, uh, digital accessibility needs such as website evaluations, uh, uh, document accessibility, and other kinds of training sessions like that. Uh, Carl, do you want to talk a little bit about SENA? Certainly. Uh, so the National Federation of the Blind Center of Excellence in Non-Visual Access, we do a number of different things relating to technology for the blind. We do um, presentations each month. We call our Accessibility Boutiques. The next one coming up on January 31st is <laughs> um, you know, advocating and reporting accessibility issues in a way that companies can use and benefit from and how to find where to report the issues. We also do other topics on document accessibility, web testing, various web accessibility topics, and more. We work with technology vendors from around the country, both big and small, to help make their technology products more accessible to the blind. And we also have the International Braille and Technology Center, which is a room that has a wide representative sample of tech available to people who are blind in the US. And you can come and learn about the tech, you know, demo it, see what they have there. We also do reviews of different technologies, which are posted on our blog and in our Braille Monitor magazine. Stephen? Okay, thank you, Carl. With that, let us get to the meat of today's presentation. We're going to start with document accessibility. Kind of the, the first thing everyone thinks about, or at least comes to uh, when working with digital accessibility in some form, because there's a lot of Word documents, PDFs, other kinds of documents out there that come out to you through email, through websites, uh, and it tends to form the basis of a lot of uh, work in the classroom. You know, textbooks and such can be digitized or, you know, handing out readings and such. The challenge here is there's a lot we can cover and there's always something new that can be added to document accessibility so today's going to be kind of more of a short introduction to being like here is like the basic starting point for you guys you know here's what you can do immediately from the get-go without much training you know this is going to lead into further presentations on document accessibility we have some on our youtube channel the nfb has some plenty of other resources exist out there for this. So once you feel that you've mastered what we've talked about today, you should start looking at those presentations or possibly sign up for one of ours that are coming later in the year and learn more about this topic and take that next step. But start off, all document types should have all text for images, the most basic requirement you will always see in digital accessibility anywhere. There's a reason is the very first line of the guidelines. <laughs> the second thing is headings for navigation. That actually uh, helps all, everyone, even yourself, because that will organize the document into quick jump points. Uh, so it is not just for visual purposes, but it also gives you a programmatic, essentially bookmark that you can use to move around quickly. The third thing is that you need to establish an intended reading order. In most text documents, this will be pretty standard. You won't need to do much to uh, establish that. But there are times when, especially if your document has like a multi-column layout, or if it's something more like a flyer that has parts that are flying around or has like text with charts and such, you'll need to check the reading order there so that it, it flows in a way that makes sense to the person and it's how you intended it for them to read it, 
rather than letting the program try to assign a reading order because then it's simply going to follow the default for whatever language you're using. Uh, and then the fourth point is start with the accessibility checker for the associated program. Microsoft Office has one for uh, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. Uh, Adobe Acrobat has one if you have the pro version, so the paid version. Uh, the checker is not available in the free version. Uh, all of your results obviously will still work in the free version. If you've tagged the document, it'll be readable, but you can't actually do the checks without that. On screen, uh, there are the examples of the word accessibility checker. You can get to it through the info tab of the, the file the ribbon. Uh, in uh, Word, this is from Word 2016. If you have 365, um, it might be a little bit different, uh, but you can go to inspect document and then check accessibility, uh, or you can use the help bar and the help bar can take you straight to it. That'll open the tab you'll see on the right that lists the inspection results where it starts with the errors. So things that are actually a problem, warnings, things that it can't determine on its own, but tell you might impact the accessibility. It will then give you additional information of why to fix it and how to fix it, which is really the parts that you're going to be looking at when you're first starting out, because you'll, you'll learn how this impacts people and then how you can quickly fix it. And it'll give you a step-by-step -step instruction of how to do that. That's why the accessibility checker is a really good starting point for people who are not familiar at all with making documents accessible because it gives you an easy to follow guide and helps you find the most common errors um, that are, are easy to fix. Once you start getting comfortable with making those things, then you can move to the next step, which is looking more at uh, more complex documents or things like tables, and uh, then going into better, better alt text and more uh, useful semantics. Some more tips for your documents. First, don't lock the file. Uh, if you don't want people editing it, because that actually stops uh, assistive technology like screen readers from actually reading the document. So in doing that, you're essentially cutting them out of all the work that you've done. So don't lock the document. Um, and it's also, especially in the classroom, it's best if you don't lock it because then you also allow people to make their own notes in there uh, without potentially screwing things up, you know, but make sure that you keep a clean copy available for people in case they do. Uh, the second point is use templates and style presets. A lot of the things we've talked about, like adding headings and such, you have to use the style presets in order to create those programmatically. It'll look like it if you bold it or underline it and make the font larger, but it won't act like a heading unless you use the style preset. When we get into the demo of this, I'll show you how to, to do that and change those styles to fit you. Uh, if you can, try to provide information and data in tables instead of charts and graphs. Tables tend to be more uh, accessible by the nature of them. Um, you can also, in tables, use heading cells in order to programmatically give that uh, association to a, a cell further into the table. Whereas with the charts and graphs, you have to sometimes get tricky with the reading order in order to create those logical associations in people's heads. And in some cases, especially if you have a lot of data in a chart, um, it's too much for the alt text because there is a limit on characters and we don't have a way to communicate all the info quick in, in that manner. So if possible, though, or if you've done a chart or a graph or something, if you're using a, another Adobe program, try to split it up rather than making it into a single image, because if you are able to use real text, in other words, text that's not part of an image, so in, in Adobe, if you export it from, let's say, Illustrator or Photoshop to a PDF, you'll be able to treat those bits of text as separate elements that users can still read because you've tagged them. I'll explain what that means later. Uh, but if you don't do that and you make it just a single whole, then you have to add all that information to the alt text and it won't be as useful. So
Ah, okay. I will get to that question afterwards, but thank you for pointing that out. Uh, when we talk about PowerPoint, I'll make sure to mention Google Slides. Thank you. Do that there. Okay. Uh, one thing to note about PowerPoint, uh, their reading order is from bottom to top in the arranged selection pane. I will uh, show you guys that momentarily, but it is the one thing to keep in mind if you're using PowerPoint versus Word or Excel, because that that is somewhat unintuitive and people don't realize that until they've uh, found out later. Um, it, it, PowerPoint does give a, a warning about that in the accessibility checker, but it's kind of buried, so you have to find it first. So that's why we always try to make sure to warn people PowerPoint's not going to work the same way as everything else. Keep that in mind. Uh, if you are, if you have like a chart or graph or something uh, in PowerPoint slides that you're not able to add sufficient alt text to to describe it because it, you know there's a lot of data in it or whatever, um, adding notes or comments uh, is a good way to add additional explanation uh, for those sections because that at least give people an understanding that, okay, I need to look at the note or the comment in order to explain that. Make sure to mention that in the alt text of the image so that they know to go looking for it. Uh, and then finally, when you save the document as a PDF, make sure that you've checked the tagged PDF option because uh, that is how you make sure that all of the work you've done in Word or Excel or what have you isn't wasted when you send it to a PDF and the PDF doesn't take any of that information and use it. So again, I'll show how to do that right now. So uh, we're going to start with Word and then we'll look at PowerPoint and Excel quick. Most of the accessibility checker is the same in both. Um, and the only reason I'm going to bring up the other two is just so you can see a, a couple of differences between them. So start off here is a word document this is a test document i use for other presentations if you notice on the left here i have the navigation pane open you can get to that from view and then there's a checkbox in the show group which is the second group on the ribbon uh, is the third checkbox there under grid lines this navigation pane shows you shows you all the headings in your document once you've made them so, uh, again, a screen reader is able to use headings in order to jump around a document quickly, but this is a way that those uh, without disabilities or with other kinds of disabilities can also move around the document quickly because I can just click table demonstration and it immediately jumps me down there. So very useful for especially really long documents like uh, a chapter of a textbook or uh, a, a report that you're having them uh, having your students read. Now, the accessibility checker, there's two ways you can get to it. Like I mentioned, you can go to file and then info, the second button, inspect document. Uh, in this case, the button might say check for issues and then check accessibility. The other method is to use the help uh, bar, uh, alt Q, uh, and that, um, since I use it all the time, it's my first option recently in recently used, but it is uh, just an easy way you can get it as you start typing access, it'll pop up as one of the options here. Now, uh, oh, I didn't clear that last time. So if you notice, there's only warnings in there right now because we have uh, a single, we have an element here that is not in line. But if I go into this image, I'm going to do this kind of in reverse order. So with images, pretty much always it's going to be in some kind of properties menu. And in the case of uh, Microsoft Office, it's format picture. You'll go into layout on properties and there's the alt text box. So for this MD tap logo, I have that in the description here. If I take that out and leave it blank, now it shows up in the accessibility checker. So it tells me you need to add alt text to this image. Why? Because that helps readers understand information presented in pictures and other objects. In most cases, people using screen readers. How to fix it? As I mentioned, you'll right click on it 
and click format. Uh, you can also use the format ribbon that appears when you've selected a picture. And then you, can, you would go into, into the, the format uh, page. Uh, and then we would go into on size and properties, and that would have the uh, alt text section. So that's where we can just, you know, describe our logo. For logos and such, we call them, you know, whatever the department name or agency name or whatever it is, the logo of the company, and then logo, because it's more important users are understanding this is a logo something than trying to go into a huge amount of detail because then we're giving them a lot of extraneous information that isn't terribly helpful to them. So other kinds of uh, errors you'll find on here are things like uh, images are not in line. Like in this case, it's a warning. That is because since this is uh, floating with text wrapping and not in line with text, Word doesn't know how to uh, put that in line with things for something like a screen reader. So. Right now, the screen reader could go from this logo to the next heading table demonstration and skip it entirely. And you might find this at the very start of the document, you might find it at the very end of the document, um, or it might try to insert in between things, uh, depending on how it's finding it. Other kinds of things you'll see here are errors like there's no heading cells in a table, or this chart doesn't have uh, demonstrations. Uh, or uh, this chart doesn't have alt text, um, other things like that. So in general, these errors are a good way to start looking for uh, or how to make these basic fixes, like I need headings or I need alt text on images, or this is not in, in reading order, that kind of thing. Uh, as for the presets themselves. So if I go to heading this heading one, if you notice up here in the home ribbon in the styles uh, grouping, the heading one is selected. If I select the text above it, that just goes to normal. That is what creates that heading over here in the navigation pane. In the case of this heading one, it's there, but if you notice, it looks different. That's because there's a new style here. Well, it, that jumps it up, but if I want to change that to normal, I can select style, it's removed from the navigation. If I want to make it a heading, I can go to more styles and I can create a style. So let's change that. Again, we'll make it, let's say, uh, green text. Bold, underline, let's jump up its font size. Now I want to create a style. The first uh, dialog box is just the basic naming of it, but we want to click modify. And it's here that we can say uh, what we want this to be. In this case, the style, you'll add a style name, but then the style based on is what is. Uh, how it's going to be interpreted by a screen reader. Normal is just standard text. No spacing is just standard text without any spacing above or below it. And then you have headings one through six or one through nine in Word. Uh, almost no cases do I see you using below six because or above six because at that point you subdivided your content so much. Um, it, it's rare for it to get that far, but in most cases, you want to use heading one as kind of the start of your document, or in the case of something larger like a textbook or chapter, you might use it to divide up chapters. Uh, heading two is for major blocks of content, heading three and such are subdivision. But think of it as an outline. If you notice on the navigation pane, how it's kind of nested inside each other, that's how it works. So you have the heading one as your easy jump point to the start of the document, your heading two for each major area, and then a heading three and such below in order to get through content quickly. There's other kinds of um, tags here, uh, which we would cover more in a proper document accessibility webinar. It's a lot to go through today. Um, 
for, so to start off, I would say focus on making sure you have these headings and that navigation pane set up because that is a way for people to efficiently move around your document and read through it. So that's a very good starting point. Now, uh, I'm gonna quickly save. Before I move to PowerPoint and Excel, I do want to show you uh, how to save this as a PDF. So in this case, file, save as PDF. Uh, you'll see this document or the, sorry, dialog box where you select where you want to save it. Now we wanna click options. And we wanna make sure this third checkbox, enable accessibility and reflow with tagged Adobe PDF is checked because that is what tells the Adobe program, here's all of the headings I created, all the alt text I added, and here, use that in order to do the same thing in your program. If you don't check this and you go into the PDF and do an accessibility checker, all of your work is not going to be there. It's going to be gone. So to avoid having to double up, you want to make sure that you've checked this. Um, you can also create those bookmarks using the headings as well. Um, styles, depending on what uh, other text you've used or something, you might have that there. Or if you want to use other kind of, so there's a, a couple other styles that might apply um, to things like examples and such. Uh, that might be useful for you, but that I'm going to leave to you because that's more just um, generic functionality than it is accessibility. So that's the, the very basics of Word. Um, with PowerPoint, and I am going to pull over today's presentation in order to show you. I'm gonna to go to our first slide. And the only thing I'm really gonna show you here is that selection pane because the accessibility checker is the exact same as, as Word. It'll same functionality, same everything, but in order to establish reading order in PowerPoint, we need to go to arrange and then the selection pane that's from, available from the home ribbon. Um, if you're using the accessibility checker, it'll warn you of this as well. Now, again, this is where PowerPoint's different in that it makes you go from bottom to top. So if a screen reader was reading this slide, it would start with the title, making accessible learning experience. They would read the subtitle, then we would read the first logo, which is the NFB's logo, and then we would read the empty tab logo because that's the order I've set it in. I can click and drag these around uh, versus something like Word where it's going to almost always try to force that uh, top down, left, right uh, because it's in English uh, functionality unless I change the layout significantly. Whereas with PowerPoint, since you can move things around on the slide however you wish, you need to be uh, looking at it through the selection pane. So I will warn you, uh, there are occasions where, depending on how you've put things into the document, this will also affect the visual presentation. If I move like the NFB's logo underneath our logo, but if you notice, it's still gonna read their logo first because it's, that's where it is in the pane. So things closer to the top are actually on the bottom layer. So instead of reading top layer down, screen readers will read bottom layer up in PowerPoint. So this might affect how things are presented visually in your slides. So you in general want to try to keep um, the things fairly separated and don't overlap stuff. Um, if you do overlap things, again, try to make that reading order as logical as possible. That's about, as I said, that's about the only major difference between a PowerPoint and Word in terms of accessibility. And then I do want to show you Excel because Excel, since it's you know, a giant table, it's going to have different functionality. Again, it's gonna have uh, the user, most screen readers and other forms of assistive technology are gonna let a user move around this like the same way uh, someone without disabilities might use the arrow keys to move around. Uh, however, we do have headings in this document and kind of the same idea here. 
Uh, the way this is done though is a cell styles. So in these, uh, we have titles and headings. Again, you can change these look however you want, but you need to make sure that you're using these formats because if you don't, then those associations are not going to be there. And so that means when a user goes down to CVS Waldorf in row five, column A, they're only gonna hear that. But because we have that heading, they'll hear a location name CVS Waldorf. And that association gives them a lot more context that they don't have to try and remember themselves. Uh, again, other than that, you have the accessibility checker here too. Again, same functionality, a uh, good place to start off. Okay. Let me start the slideshow again. Uh, before I take questions, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about PDF accessibility. Um, PDF accessibility can be a greater challenge. Uh, you do want to use their checker, which is available uh, or requires Acrobat Pro, the paid version. Um, it also has uh, the same kind of uh, functionality and that's checking for alt text, check in reading order, checking for headings, tables, and what have you. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, challenging to use, which is why we don't want to go into it too much today. We're just going to kind of talk about it. Generally, uh, you really should check out some of our other webinars to learn more about it because we can spend an entire hour on PDFs alone. Um, but they'll have, again, you can right click any of the errors that pop up in the report and click check or explain and it will take you to a website that explains that particular error and why it showed up um, you do need to check the reading order manually in which case this would be the reading order panel in acrobat pro because uh you can you have a lot more leeway in how you arrange things in pdfs um, but in general, our recommendation is start from Microsoft Office, especially Word, and save it from Word to PDF because you'll be able to do, you'll be able to handle a lot more in a simpler manner than trying to do all of the work in Acrobat. Um, because the nature of Word as a text editor it is going to just make that simpler. Um, you do want to consider other formats, though. Uh, PDFs can be challenging, both for users and for yourself, trying to make it accessible. It, it is one of the hardest to remediate because it retains all the graphical styles and other um, metadata. You know, it's designed uh, as a, 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 a graphical uh, document thing. It, it's supposed to handle that kind of printing uh, information so it can be one of the more challenging to use um, inherently word um, or html especially is much more accessible um, epub is also has been also making a lot of strides to make themselves accessible so that's another format you might want to consider uh, with that we'll spend about five minutes on questions oh google slides i should have mentioned that uh, google slides and the google suite in general uh, has a lot of these accessibility features as well. Uh, for if you put in images and such, you can add alt text. Um, in most cases, that's going to be either right click and it should be add alt text near the bottom, or I believe it's control alt y is the keyboard shortcut to do it. Um, uh, but one of the challenges with Google Slides in particular is that it does not have the uh, ability to change the reading order manually. Um, there are add-ons you can get that can help with that, um, but those of you in the state like myself, you might not be able to get those add-ons. I, I don't think I have it installed um, because uh, the permission restrictions and such, but uh, what you can do is do you know a lot of the work in Google Slides and for the most part, if you follow the templates, you won't have any issues. Um, it'll still be in the correct reading order. The only time it might be an issue is if you add additional content to the slide, and that's going to depend on what order you put that in. Uh, if you need to make an accessible version, usually the best method is download the slide deck from Google as a PowerPoint presentation and do the finishing touches there. 
All right. Let's see, well, you have tips for school systems, primarily using the Google suite of tools. Okay, we just talked a little bit about this. Um, as I said, uh, Google, Google has done a lot of work in order to make their stuff accessible. Um, Carl, you might want to jump in at any point. If you have any uh, additional things you want to say about it, um, in general, though, it has it has the styles you will need. Uh, those presets you can apply headings in the documents. There's a navigation pane there. You can add alt text. Um, it just might be a little trickier to use because you are using a browser based thing. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to say. You know, Google Suite does support all most of the same accessibility headings, table, you know, tables and thing and alt text and things um if you're a blind user using it or you know, are helping someone who's blind or giving them direction know that google does have a bunch of its own shortcut keys and things so it behaves differently than a regular web page and if a screen reader user tries to browse it like a regular web page um things will not go well and you know that, that's certainly something that you could reach out to us if you have further questions uh but that is a little bit beyond the scope of this boutique for that aspect or this presentation i should say thank you carl uh last question i have so far is my options in word look a bit different for saving as a pdf under a section called include non-printing information there's a box already checked called document structure tags for accessibility is that the same thing I believe so. Um, I know there's a couple options that have changed if you're using Office 365. Um, I have 2016 on my computer at the moment. Um, I have not yet up upgraded to it, uh, but I believe that should still um, include the, the tags needed to make a PDF accessible. So yes, uh, there is one thing I would like also like to mention. Um, Office 365 did add the option for when you're adding alt text to images, there'll now be a checkbox for marking something as decorative. So if that image is just like a divider row or divider line or something, or it's some kind of image that doesn't give any additional information, um, or is there something really there to fill space, and then you want to click that checkbox. Um, uh, Adobe has that also. Um, if you had older versions of Microsoft Office, it won't be there though. And in those cases, typically you'll just add decorative to the alt text so that a user knows to skip it. Okay, uh, Google says from the file menu, select save as and choose whether you want to, where you want the file to be saved. In the save as dialog box, select PDF from the save as type list. By default, this produces a PDF that preserves the document structure and assures accessibility. Well, that's great to hear. Um, uh, I know that older versions uh, will use the like save as Adobe PDF, which is what I used. Um, if you just save the document as another type, there's no guarantee. But if they've put in that functionality, that's excellent to hear. And feel free to use that. Only thing I would say is, double test it the first time don't just assume that it worked for you you know trust but verify because there's, there's we're working with computers there's always a chance something goes wrong <laughs> okay uh in the interest of time and i don't believe i see any other questions right now uh carl i will throw it over to you for the next section sure certainly and as steven just discussed word documents and document accessibility word excel PowerPoint PDF. It's also important that if you're dealing with a learning management system or LMS or any sort of online content, you follow similar accessibility guidelines with headings, you know, graphics, alt text labels, and there's a few more points to consider. So for this section, we'll be talking about the syllabus, uh, the coursework, quizzes, uh, <clears throat> and other learning management system accessibility uh, concerns. So starting off with the syllabus, uh, you'll want to have a good heading structure in your document so that uh, the title of the document is a heading one, each main area is a heading two, and then any subsections of those areas are heading three or onward. 
Uh, you want to make sure all content is in, you know, as Stephen said, real text, so not a text inside an image. And that really goes for any document or any content you're creating. Don't use pictures of text if you can at all help it. They just cause extra problems. You have to then put the actual text in the alt text anyway. And it's just less hassle for everyone involved to just use real text whenever possible. Uh, if you have links in your syllabus, make sure they clearly indicate where the <clears throat> link is going to, whether it's another part of this document, whether it's another page, whatever, it should be clear. Uh, for, for your assignments, make sure each assignment you know, that you're putting in your syllabus is distinct with due date, and maybe even make that a separate file for easy, easy reference. Have a Word document as well. You'll, you don't want to really have only the online version. People may want to download it, print it out, save it locally to their computer, whatever the case may be. So having a downloadable Word, Word document we recommend version is really useful to your, to your students and to anyone accessing the syllabus. All right, on to coursework. So each LMS is going to have different accessibility features, at tools in the editor for adding headings, labeling graphics, uh, doing tables, all that stuff. Find those tools for your particular LMS that you're using and make sure you're familiar with them. Recommend that you have an accessibility checklist handy. Uh, there are many different ones out there from different organizations on Google and whatever, um, but you'll, you'll wanna make sure you're creating your coursework accessible and don't miss a step. Uh, interactive activities. You'll want to consider how you're going to make that accessible, uh, depending what they are. If they're multiple choice questions or you know quiz type things, we'll get to those in a bit. Um, other interactive tools, you'll want to check the accessibility of that tool first. Uh, if you have a blind student in your classroom or or you know, know someone who is one, you may want to have them check over what you're planning to do ahead of time. Uh, it will definitely require some extra thought and planning to do uh, interactive activities well. Um, you can also discuss other methods of you know, conveying the information or driving engagement by your students if needed as an alternative to the activity. Though if you can make the original activity accessible, that is really the best. And to that end, pre-planning and knowing what you're going to do for a given assignment further in advance is better. You know, sure, you can try to scramble and put something together the night or the weekend before the assignment's going to be due. But if you know, already have your course syllabus laid out, putting something together a month or more in advance you know, get, give you plenty of time to test it, make sure it works, discuss with your student how the best to handle it, and et cetera. All right, on to quizzes. So this introduces one new piece in the accessibility puzzle that the document accessibility didn't really cover much, and that is forms. Online, you can have form fields. These can be multiple choice, like a radio button group or check boxes. Uh, edit boxes, drop down boxes, buttons, all those things. You need to make sure you have good labels. So the if it's just a type your answer box, the question should be the label of that edit box. Uh, if you have a group of radio buttons or check boxes, you'll want to make sure, and most LMSs that are accessible should have ways of doing this, um, that if each radio button or checkbox has the answer as its label and the whole group has the question as its label. Similarly for drop downs, you want to make sure they have labels. Um, if you're using an image or chart, uh, make sure you have at, at a bare minimum alt text on the chart. There are ways to do it without giving away the answer. Um, Consider using an audio explanation or a text description of the chart that may get into more detail. 
if it's a table, say, you know, or if it's tabular data, say you're showing population growth over a specific time or a series of coordinates on a graph, putting those some of those in more of a table format may help for accessibility um, rather than just showing the chart and just trying to describe the line or building the question to be more accessible. Those are all things to consider. Um, as far as time limits go, you'll want to make sure that you have a decent amount of time for people to complete the, the quiz or whatever the, the, they're doing. Um, allow students to request more time uh, to complete that because people do work at different paces. Some people need a little more time to complete a given assignment. So be cognizant of that as well. All right. For video and audio, you really need to have captioning for the video, if at all possible, or at least a transcript. This is useful not just for someone who may be deaf or hard of hearing, but someone may want to remember you talked about some random topic about halfway through your lecture. And rather than trying to scrub through the video and back and forth, try to find that what well, might be a 20 or 30 second segment where you said a very important point they can just search the transcript to find that point in the video or that keyword that they remember you talked about and go from there. As you're going through the video, if it's say a lecture, make sure you're clearly describing what's on screen and <clears throat> so that someone can follow it without looking. Again, very useful for someone who's blind or low vision, but may also be useful for, say, if a student wants to take notes on the video. They don't have to keep flipping back to the video screen to see what you're doing on the whiteboard if you're narrating as you're writing down your math equations or biology diagrams or chemistry formulas or whatever the case may be. They can, if, you, if it's well described, they can follow along and take notes without even needing to watch the screen. Or they may want to listen to the lecture to study with it, but not be focused on the video the whole time. So well-explained lecture also helps in that sense. Uh, if there are relevant sounds, they should be mentioned in the uh, transcript or captions. Um, audio, and also, if there's anything on screen, that should definitely be mentioned in the audio description. Also, be mindful of what audio what video player you're using some video players have more accessibility than others um there are some players that allow you to embed questions into the video if you're planning on using things like that make sure to test that for accessibility first all right so now we're going to play a couple of videos uh, and we'll discuss you know a bad example of what not to use as a video for your course for a course and a good example of what can be used. So we'll start with the first video. All right, so as you can hear, that was just music. Uh, Stephen, for those of us who can't see, I want to just briefly describe what was being shown in that video. Sure. So at the start, uh, what they have done is they had a, a particular uh, element on a uh, drop stick that went into the glass beaker that has a solution into it. Uh, when it's dipped in, it starts expanding, turns into uh, it, what looks to be essentially a ball of ice. Right. So again, you know, in the video itself, if you're not looking at it, there's no way to know what is going on there. It's just music. And so if you're trying to reference the science experiment for studying or if you're a blind or low vision user, you can't see what's going on in the video. A video like that is very unhelpful because it's just music. It's just 
stuff going on on screen to background music. And unfortunately, that is the case for a lot of science videos on YouTube and various other things. And a lot of vid videos will just play music while they show whatever's going on. So it's important to, ch to vet your video. And for the second video, I just want to quickly add as well, there is a little bit of text on screen during that past video, but that's part of the video itself. It's not in the closed captions, which are unavailable according to YouTube player. So that means all of that text is unavailable to someone and it's all in red. So someone who is red green color blind is likely going to have trouble trying to read the red text on the black background in these first few frames. Okay. Second video. The hydrogen and oxygen in the form of water, and this happens. Here's what happens when I poured it on toilet paper. If you mix it with hydrogen peroxide, then you get an even crazier solution that can now also dissolve pure carbon, called piranha solution. Here's when I dissolved a hot dog with piranha solution. All right, so this video is definitely better. It tells you about basically what he's doing. He's dipping or pouring a solution on toilet paper, and then he's dissolving a hot dog in another solution. It's better. It talk, He talks through kind of what he's doing what you'd, you'd expect to some, some of the results. But again, while the experiment's going on, the, the result is not described. It doesn't, he doesn't go into detail about what's going on visually. He assumes that you can see the <clears throat> video, the visual impact of what's going on. So that's, it's better. It can still be used, but you'd still, even for a video like that, you'd probably want to give a separate document describing some of the visual aspects to help uh, supplement the video that was already provided. And so those two examples are just a brief glimpse as to why it's very important to vet your videos and your content before using them in a course to make sure that they are accessible, have good explanations and things like that. Moving on, so we're actually using it in the in the presentation today, but you may want to consider using this in a course is Scribe for Meetings. Uh, it's scribeformeetings.com, scribe, S-C-R-I-B-E-F-O-R-M-E-E-T-I-N-G-S.com. And it's a service that allows you to take a PowerPoint slide and upload it to the service with, with a Zoom or Microsoft Teams link. And then once the PowerPoint is uploaded, it will take that PowerPoint and render it into a more accessible format so that when in Zoom and Teams and things, as you're presenting slides or whatever, those slides in real time are not accessible to the person using a screen reader listening to your presentation. So Scribe for Meetings, renders it in a separate web page that makes the slides accessible to someone, to an attendee of the meeting. Um, still definitely recommend making your PowerPoint as accessible as you can. And it will, but it will help to, if you missed an audio just, or a alt text on a graphic, uh, if the structure is not the greatest, it will try to do, you know, help with some of that. Now, automated accessibility remediation is still limited at this point, but it will certainly be better than nothing. Um, right now, Scribe works with Zoom and Microsoft Teams meetings, and we've been using it for a number of months now at the NFB, and it, it is working uh, very well for a number of different Zoom presentations that we've done. Steven? Okay. All right. Uh, our last kind of major topic for today is captioning. So as you've noticed, you know, we already kind of showed it with video and audio, but there's some specifics we'd like to point out. So first off, with recorded material, um, 
you want to make sure that you are, if you have multiple speakers, you name them um, so that people know who's a, providing the information or if there's someone else speaking, uh, especially for those who are deaf of hard of hearing. Um, there, there's a, other conventions to captioning you can look into, um, but in general, you want to try and make them as grammatically correct as possible and include any relevant information like we mentioned with the sound effects. Uh, if you remember from that experiment video where he was pouring the solution over the toilet paper, there was no sound effect for that. So, you know, and there's no visual description, obviously, or audio description of the visual, sorry. But that would have been a good place to insert a sound effect and then you would also want to mention in the captioning, if that sound effect was there, that it's happening because it was a very uh, uh, expansive reaction. Like it, it started off kind of slow and then it just blew up essentially. So you want to make sure that you're getting across that same information to users in that manner. Um, a good easy way to handle captioning, especially if you're completely new to it, is with YouTube and it's auto-generated captions when you upload a video, you can go in and edit those. Very simple to do. And it takes care of like, you know, 70 to 90% of the work. Uh, but you do want to make sure that you go in and edit those if you generate them because it won't be able to handle things like uh, specific names or complicated uh, parts like say he was mentioning maybe the chemical formula, it might not get that right. Um, and also, uh, depending on other parts, you want to just make sure that you go in and edit those so that it is correct because the auto generation might not have the exact uh, or the correct context for that information. Excuse me. Uh, just want to quickly show you guys how to do that. Here we are. So this is one of our videos on our channel. This was a webinar we, uh, Carl and I did back in November. Um, this was actually captioned by, again, uh, someone who uh, was doing the captioning for our, our webinars, but it's still the same idea is either when you're uploading the video on, I believe the second step, there will be add subtitles and there'll be, you know, like add cards and, uh, and other options like that, subtitles. And uh, in this case, since I'm in an already published video, I've gone into the video details by clicking that video. I can go to the subtitles button on the right. Here is all of our subtitles for that video. It uh, has its timing on the right here. If this was the generate auto generated version, we would be, you know, in a previous version where it would say, you know, select your track or whatever. And we would select the auto generated. Same idea. We could go in and edit these. We can move these around here. I can add a new section or a segment in between. I can edit the, the timing manually, or I can use the timeline at the bottom in order to drag them around to where I want them to match up. Um, you know, and then there's also uh, under the video player itself, uh, it'll show you the keyboard shortcuts uh, that you can use for pausing the video as you're typing in, if it's something you don't have a transcript for, um, or if you need to, you know, if you need to hear exactly what they're saying, you can slow it down, you can jump frame or, you know, 10 seconds back and forth, change volume, that kind of thing. Once you've done that, you can save it. Um, or in this case, since it's on, I would edit an already existing track, I would just select done or I could select save as draft. Uh, if you are generating a new one, then you would have to click probably, I think there'll be another button here saying save. But again, very simple to do because you can go down to and make sure that like my name is correct. You know, my name is Steven. My last name, you know, which can be a little tricky to say, Palachek. Um, you know, I want to make sure that it's spelled correctly here. So I would go in and type it in, you know, Carl's name, you know, Bellinger, making sure that that is National Federation of the Blind. You know, it's not capitalized because by default, the auto-generated captions aren't going to have any grammatical things like this. It's not going to have like periods or the colon or what have you. It's not going to have people's names either. So that's where it's a good point. Oh, there's my last name. Um, 
that is a, a good thing to also do because it makes it easier for people to understand um, because you know you're adding those grammar rules to the captions as well as establishing uh, identifying you know people speaking or sound effects or other relevant information that might all be presented visually now uh, last thing with captioning is if you're doing a live presentation, such as our current one, um, the, most platforms now have some form of auto translation or auto captioning or AI subtitles, depending on what program you're using, what they call it. They are good for like your regular classes or for you know short meetings between people. Um, they will only be around 80% accurate, same as the auto-generated captions for YouTube. There's only so much they can do, especially if you're working with someone who maybe has an accent or a, a, a lisp or other, other thing that might interfere with its interpretation. Um, and it also just can't handle like proper names and uh, acronyms and such. So, uh, they're good when you have nothing else available, um, and they're they're decent to rely on on for uh, regular internal meetings or what have you. If you're doing larger presentations um, or like a, a major presentation or something, that's when you want to hire a, a captioner. And don't try and do it yourself um, unless you are able to type over two hundred words per minute, because you won't be able to keep up. Um, a lot of Captioners have uh, special software or keyboards for this purpose, and they have also obviously practiced in order to get their typing speed up to that level in general. It, and especially if you're the presenter, you're going to be having to split your attention between the two, and that's very, very difficult. So it's best to hire a service to handle it for you. Um, you do need to make sure that you check your account settings for enabling this feature. Uh, Zoom has it in the account settings and I believe it's in the advanced part of the in meeting settings um, for WebEx if you're using that you have to go into uh, there's an add-on I believe uh, meeting assistant I think it's called that's where you have to enable that and then Microsoft Teams uh, should have it in your user settings or uh, it might be in your organization settings uh, for that so making sure that you've enabled that feature because you will want it. And then finally, um, make sure to allow saving a copy of the captions so that users are able to get that transcript after the meeting uh, or that you can get it from the recording so that you can provide it because that way, as Carl mentioned, rather than trying to find and scroll through a timeline of a video trying to find something, they can go to that captioning file, control F for find, find exactly what they were looking for, a close approximation, and then go to the video and jump to it immediately. So it's a usually a better way for that. Uh, we are a little over time, but I do want to quickly mention just routing to accessible material. Um, this is a, a concept that kind of came about um, through our work where we want to make sure people understand that this isn't, this is, available. As Carl's mentioned, it's best to make the the, the single you know, document or what have you, project, class, activity accessible, um, because that way you only have to maintain and update the one. Uh, you make sure that everyone gets the same information, e you know, equal access, equal opportunity, and we don't have to uh, cause any you know, segregation. But in in some cases, um, especially if you're having to offer alternatives or using someone else's resources and having to make an accessible version from theirs, you need to make sure people are aware that it, it's available. So uh, and some good tips for this are add accessible to the file name and title. Uh, put it first, don't put it after the uh, non-accessible version or you know make sure there's a link in that version to the alternative copy. Um, Explain limitations or warn users of inaccessible materials. If you're having in your LMS, you're going to have an activity um, that is problematic. Warn them before they go into that so that they're not trying to find the inaccessible or the accessible version while they're 
fussing around with that version. Um, also, you know, warn them if like, say, you know, there's this keyboard shortcut in here that might interfere with your screen reader and that kind of thing. Um, and usually those are best to discuss with the individual student, um, what they might encounter and what might be problematic. Um, uh, make sure that there's also some kind of maybe skip link or maybe insert that if like there's this big graph that is inaccessible, you know, filling up this entire page. I want to put a quick hyperlink above it to say here, skip to the table version below. So that way they don't have to try and move through that chart to get to the table that they can use. Um, and then again, as Carl mentioned, making sure there's adequate time for responses. So you know, what we're doing is making sure that people can get to the information that best suits them faster rather than having to you know, sort through everything on there. With that, uh, our contact information is on screen. Um, for MD tap, we have our group email, which is mdod.nva at maryland.gov. There's also our website, mdod.maryland.gov. On our website, you can look for the technology assistance program. Uh, and there's also the ITA access initiative under resources. Uh, for NFB SENA, their email is access at nfb.org. Their website is nfb.org slash programs dash services slash SENA. I believe also you can get to it just from nfb.org slash SENA. C-E-N-A. We say SENA, but it's a C. That's not an S. With that, uh, we will do our second round of questions. Uh, if people have any other like questions about TAP and such, please feel free to ask. Um, I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, we do have something in chat that might be useful. Um, this worked really well. I had it send me a Word doc of the meeting PowerPoint, and I was able to take notes in it as you were talking, not send me the video links. If you want that to come through, then you have to share those in the chat, I guess. An image of the video did come through. Ah, OK, so you use the scribe for meetings. That's good to hear. Um, those videos, uh, since we're at the end of the presentation, I will make sure to link them separately in the email that comes to you guys with the recording and the slide deck. Uh, but they are embedded just from the slide deck. Um, but PowerPoint and videos doesn't always work smoothly. So that's why I had open separately. But I will make sure to separate those out for you. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, but it's good to hear that uh, you at least got everything from there from Scribe for Meetings, and that worked very well. Good. I'm going to stop the recording since it seems like we don't have any questions. Great. But people do. <laughs>